In The Lord of the Rings, a rather plain-looking ring possesses many powers. Whoever will own this ring may become invisible or immortal, see their strength increase, stop aging, and understand the creatures that lurk in the shadows. Of course, this is only fiction. Or could there be some truth to this story? You're listening to The Voice of Jewels, a podcast from L'Ecole School of Jewelry Arts, supported by Van Cleef and Arpels, unveiling the stories and secrets behind history's most fascinating jewels. Wouldn't you say jewelry empowers us? Don't some jewels make us feel invincible? Some stones and diamonds might. Take our blue diamond, for example. In any case, that is how some kings felt as they collected gems, had them set on their crowns, and had exuberant sets of jewelry and insignia designed as a means to display their power. The famous golden fleece, which King Louis XV had made for himself, is one of those jewels. It reflects absolute power, as well as its overthrow. In the middle of this insignia shines an unusual blue diamond he inherited from his great-grandfather, Louis XIV. It seems as if this gem may very well be invested with many powers. It is the middle of the night, on September 11, 1792, at the Garde Meuble Hotel. A group of bold men climb up the facade of one of Paris's most beautiful buildings on Place de la Révolution. They have gone unnoticed. They break into the main salon by drilling a hole through a shutter. Once inside, they open an armoire filled with jewels and precious stones. The Garde Meuble, it's actually the depository of royal treasures and furniture. Paul Paradis, art historian and lecturer at L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts. We say the Garde Meuble de la Couronne. And since 1791, the jewels of the crown were all housed there. There was actually an inventory and people were allowed to visit. So it's not that surprising that people knew what was in this collection. There was... Um, tens of thousands of diamonds, topaz, emeralds. There were many treasures uh, that were included in this big collection. Cadet Guillot is one of the burglars. He's a young, inexperienced con artist. He barely knows he's come to rob the crown's jewels. A ball of fiery sparkle glows in his hands. He can't explain where that glow might come from. This jewel is heavier than the rest, and most of all, is quite peculiar. He takes a closer look. Its gold frame is bursting with large yellow, white, and red gemstones. A dragon shape carved out of a spinel, a gem very similar to ruby, sits on top. The beast's back has two spread wings, and a spray of flames made out of colored stones comes out of its mouth. A huge blue diamond shines like a piece of blue sky mounted in the middle. There is something sacred and mysterious about it. Cadet Guillaume gets caught up in the deep shade of blue. He has no idea. He has found the most prominent jewel of the French crown. It is the quintessential symbol of royal power. He is clueless about its value and the story of love, ambition, and power behind it. The uh, insignia of the Toison d'Or, or the Golden Fleece, was a masterpiece of French jewelry. It was recognized as such by many monarchs across Europe. The Order of the Golden Fleece uh, is, exists since the 15th century. It's one of the highest honors. And many of these uh, insignias were done with enamel or blue stones. But Louis XV had two blue diamonds uh, on his, and it was made by Jacques Main. Uh, one of the great jewelers of the time, and it was really the symbol of his power. So yes, the fact that it was at the height of French uh, know-how and jewelry at the time, that it was admired by all of the monarchs uh, all over Europe and elsewhere, and that it disappeared, all of these things probably add to the mystery. We must go back 40 years to grasp the story behind this jewel. 
back to February 25th, 1745, to be more specific, during a costume ball thrown in the honor of the wedding of the heir of the throne of France. Louis XV's son marries the king of Spain's daughter. All of Europe's most prominent figures are present. In the Hall of Mirrors of the Palace of Versailles, a great costume ball is being held. Diana Huntress is dancing with Hercules. Ottomans are chatting with Argonauts. Clad in velvet breeches, Jupiter wants to approach a minister. The King of Spain is sporting an adornment pinned onto a large red silk ribbon. But this is no faux embellishment. It is covered with small diamonds and rubies. In solid gold, what looks like the body of a sheep hangs underneath like some ancient trophy. This is the Golden Fleece Insignia. This is one of Europe's oldest chivalry orders, as well as one of the most sacred. Only the greatest men may hope to be allowed to possess and wear it. The Golden Fleece is a solar symbol. It grants the status of hero to whoever conquers it, and sometimes even sovereignty to some. So the Order of the Golden Fleece uh, was created by uh, Philip the Good. He was the Duke of Burgundy in the 15th century. So he creates this chivalric order with 31 members and 31 knights, if we can say. They had to swear their loyalty in front of God uh, to him and to the order. So we don't know precisely why Philip the Good chose the Greek myth of, of Chrysomalos, who's the, uh, the the ram whose golden fleece becomes symbolic. We don't know why they chose this story. That's uh, something that historians uh, are not quite sure of. The King of Spain is head of the Order of the Golden Fleece. He gets near the King of France. A new alliance was just sealed between the two monarchs foretelling a peaceful and glorious future. The King of Spain picks this moment to make the King of France Knight of the Golden Fleece. Louis XV is all the prouder to be made Knight of this order as his great-grandfather Louis XIV never was. Across the Hall of Mirrors, Louis XV is dressed as a yew tree, surrounded by his entourage. Beaming with his new distinction, he walks up to a young and beautiful woman dressed as Diana Huntress. Her name is Mademoiselle d'Etoile. The king is immediately smitten. A few months later, she is introduced to everyone as Marquise de Pompadour. Without knowing it, this is when the fate of the Golden Fleece is sealed. So Madame de Pompadour was really became the most honored favorite of the king and French favorite. She was not from a royal background. She was from a, sort of the, let's say, bourgeoisie or a little higher. And she meets the king uh, by accident very early on. He named her Marquise. And what's interesting is she was quite a talented uh, actress. She put on many plays. She also studied drawing and she studied uh, glyptique, which is the art of, of, of making intaglios and cameos with a certain Jacques Gay, who was actually um, working for the king. And she becomes, well, I wouldn't say she becomes a specialist, but she does create a few uh, intaglios and cameos, and she uh, protects Le Gay. So he was already working for the king, but he becomes a very important part of the court. Fast forward four years to January 1749. The Marquise de Pompadour lies by herself on a reclining chair. Two candlesticks are burning on the table. She now comes to the conclusion that in order for her king to shine even more and possibly save his crown, he will need to take on a new endeavor, as well as have the greatest distinction designed for him. She has Jacques Gay and Pierre-André Jacquemin, her two favorite craftsmen, sent for. Gay is a stone engraver, and Jacquemin is the king's jeweler. Even if you look at uh, French furniture, uh, the woodwork, it was very colorful. Um, it was not like we see it today, just uh, natural wood. There was a, a, a real taste for um, multi, for polychromy, if we can say. And you also see that in the use of Japanese lacquers, uh, Vernis Martin, the French, uh, there's that famous blue 
a little writing desk that Madame de Pompadour ordered for Bellevue. And in jewelry, yes, as well, there were these little rings and earrings with many different colored stones called giardinetti that become all the rage in the ladies of the court. The Golden Fleece is introduced on a November evening of that same year. Pierre-André Jacquemin and Jacques Gay are waiting in the little salon. The king is in a good mood. Both craftsmen reveal a stunning piece of jewelry. There simply is no match to its unique beauty. The ram is spangled with diamonds, whose undersides have been painted yellow. It hangs from Louis XV's blue diamond, surrounded by flames adorned with 84 diamonds painted red, and separated by round diamonds of five carat each. They come out of the mouth of a dragon carved out of Côte de Bretagne spinel by Jacques Gay. The radiant 32-character Great Bazou Blue Diamond sits on top, not to mention yellow sapphires and 282 small diamonds which adorn the dragon's tail and wings. The most prestigious jewels of the crown are there. This piece is astounding. Louis XV grabs the ornament and nervously pins it to his chest. The Marquise de Pompadour is feeling victorious. The king belongs among the greatest emperors. The Order of the Golden Fleece was, by all means, a creation that showed all of the know-how of, of French jewelry. But what's interesting is if you look at actually the, for example, the pavage of the diamonds, it was quite a feat to have over 450 diamonds in this setting, in this pavage type setting. You have the uh, prong setting, of course, of the beautiful blue, and you also have closed setting on uh, the four diamonds and uh, etc. It really is the, the foundations of French high jewelry. And in that sense, it was very modern. To say that it was a game changer, perhaps yes. In the treasure house of the crown jewels of France, the Garde de Meubles, a second group of men catches up with the first one. Then another group joins in. Soon about 30 men have entered the salons. The golden fleece insignia has fallen. It is passed from hand to hand. Everyone is in awe, mesmerized. The burglars go into a frenzy. It's as though they've seized the power. Chairs and bottles are brought in. A table fit for a banquet is set up. Tapestries and paintings are taken out the windows. The robbery of the Garde Meuble goes on for five nights. The guards arrest the burglars whose pockets are filled with small diamonds. They all accuse one another, hoping to get acquitted. But 17 of them wind up sentenced to death. Cadet Guillot, the man who stole the Golden Fleece, remains missing. And so does the kingdom's most precious jewel. The Golden Fleece insignia and its blue diamond have vanished into thin air. Rumor has it, they both went to England. But that is another story. Voice of Jewels is a podcast from L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts, supported by Van Cleef and Arpels. With Paul Paradis, art historian and lecturer at L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts. Written by Martin Keneon and Aram Kebaccio. Performed by Eduardo Ballerini and produced by Bababam. <laughs>